for that and continue to give them wisdom and give them knowledge in helping us to recover in our lives as well. And so be with us now as we smile upon this time and feel your presence in all these things we ask this day. In your holy name, amen. welcome you. It is always good to be in the presence of God to worship. I invite you to stand as you are able for the entry of the light, our opening hymn, and our historic affirmation of faith. I understand we'll be singing verses 1 and 3.
Let us join together in our historic affirmation of faith, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Won't you be seated? I believe Mike Howard has some music for us. you are everywhere and every when. Sometimes you feel very remote. But you're not, oh God, you are with us always and everywhere. We praise you that this is so. We ask, O oh God, that you be with us and stay with us. Guide our thoughts, direct our feet, strengthen our hands so that as we meet others, no matter where they are, no matter where we are, those others will see you in us and your grace in what we do for them. Let us pray in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
I would like to invite everyone's attention to the fact that there is a table at the back of the room by the door. On it, there is a plate. You may place your offerings as God leaves you, or you may place them in the baskets at your tables. I believe the handbells are now going to play something. Our Lord's word to us this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23 in the New Living Translation. Hear then the word of God. One day, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land. But you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways, so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, 
I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you'd look favorably on me, on me and your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, Look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us rise as we are able and sing our hymn of preparation. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Verses 1 and 3. about getting old as you do forget. <laughs> and I didn't bring up the prayer for Bill Hughes. Now you don't know who he is, but he's kin to the sheriffs and he's also kin to Miss Griffey back here. And he's in ICU and so having a breathing situation. So we want to keep Bill Hughes in our prayers as well. Lisa, I don't know if you know it or not, but John B. Dykes wrote that music 162 years ago. And I think he would be very pleased when that how the handbells did it. So give him another round of applause and a thank you for the handbells. You know, I was raised in a church where you didn't applaud. And that was almost like you were not supposed to. And I've always felt like when I was singing in the choirs and all this, and I think, did we do okay? You know, but, but then nobody wanted to applaud. But when I was in college and did acapella and all that sort of things, then we got cheered, you know, and that was a good thing to go with that sort of thing. 
As I got to wondering today, have you ever felt a desperate need for just a few minutes of time by yourself alone? Have you ever wanted that time? I don't know how you are, but I enjoy my time alone. I try to find it. But we all need time alone, and occasionally, we, you know, it clears our heads, and it also, we are able to revive ourselves from a little bit of stress that we're in. And it's, you know, but it's hard for us to imagine today uh, that it's what it's like to be a prominent person in America and not being able to have time alone, you know. I'm reminded of Jimmy Carter when he was president, and he, he had trouble with time alone. He, he went out of the Oval Office and went to the restroom right there by it. And when he got ready to leave, he thought he would push the button that would flush the toilet. He pushed the panic button. And all of a sudden, the door burst open with Secret Service agents with their guns all had pointed in wondering what was going on. So, you see, you can never be alone. Jimmy Carter, I mean, Jimmy Carter, I just told you about him, but Ronald Reagan had him so close by that when they had the White House Easter egg hunt, he had a Secret Service agent as the Easter bunny. Can you imagine a bunny carrying a gun in his back? You know, and so, but you know, time alone, I mean, can you imagine not being able to just be by yourself and not and have time alone? You know, and to think about it. Do you realize that our government has over 1,300 Secret Service agents that take care of the president, the vice president, and their families 24-7, 365? They're never alone. And I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I don't want anybody around me. I want to be away from it all. And that's one of the things that happened. Fortunately, I'm not in that area of having that much being prominent. But it takes, you know, a, a special commitment when I think about those 1,300 or so Secret Service agents, that takes a, a special commitment to stick to being 24 hours per day, seven days a week of time with somebody other than yourself. You gotta watch them and be careful of them. And that's time we have. That was where Moses was. If you heard Mark reading this wonderful story, I can imagine, I like to put myself like a fly on the wall when Moses is talking to God. Can you talk to God? Well, see, God answered Moses. At times, I have trouble getting God to answer me like I want to, but I understand he will answer me, but he'll do it in his time. And, but in the meantime, I've got to do things that are necessary. But here was Moses talking to the Lord, and he said, if your presence does not go with us, then why are we going to the promised land? That was his big question. He said, these are your people. Are you going to go with us? And that was a big question, as you heard asked. But he made many choices. He had many, Moses had a lot of crystal clear choices to make. And all of them dealt with the blessing that he was looking into for the promised land that meant nothing if God was not there with him. Where, where are you this morning? How can you imagine being here this morning and God not being here? It's in his presence because he said where two or more gather in my name, I'm there. But we have that. What else will distinguish me? And Moses said, what's going to distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? He asked God that. What's going to make us different? And, you know, he made those choices thinking about it. But he realized that there's a... One of the things that I think about at times, and I'm going to go back and look at my outline because I had a thought in my mind. But you know, when you realize where Moses was, he realized that the greatest blessings in life is knowing God. Now, sometimes we question that, don't we? And not only knowing God, but living in God's presence. A lot of times we don't realize that wherever we are, whenever, any sort of time of day, we are in God's presence, but that doesn't come to our mind. Particularly when I'm out digging in the yard and saying things that I don't want the Lord to hear. <laughs> you know? When I have a honeydew that gets this monkey grass. Oh, let me tell you, if Christianity could grow in our world like the monkey grass grew in our yard, let me tell you, God would be singing the holy, 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 you know, and it would be a marvelous thing. 
and Joy has just been working, getting it up. We started out with a patch about the size of this podium. And now we have monkey grass everywhere. We've given it away. We've done everything we can. If our faith could grow like that, God would be singing to all of us. And it's what we have to work on. It is knowing God and living in God's presence because we're in his presence all the time. 24-7, we're there. He realized that God's original plan for him, that's what he wanted for us. That was his original plan. He, as one writer wrote, and St. Augustine said, Lord, you made us for yourself, all right? And that's exactly what he was, so that he have somebody to love. But we're still in God's plan, and it will be accomplished when God's kingdom is here and established on earth, and that will be coming. And of course, I keep hearing all of this lately, what's going on in our world today, and it's tragic. What's going on around the world today, and all the things people are coming up and saying, well, these are signs of the end times. And I said, only God knows that. It is tragic what's happening across our world today for people. But Moses there, he discovered to truly know God. And this is the thing that we must understand. To truly know God, you and I must know God's glory, are you with me? And also God's goodness, it's important for us to know that. Oh yeah, we think we do it, we talk about it, and we preachers talk about it, but do we really know God's, how he, his glory and also his goodness? You see, God's glory as a concrete manifestation of a divine presence that interacts with us. That's what God's glory does for you and me. It interacts with us in our lives. And you realize that we cannot be separated from one another because we are of God's very nature. That's where we are. Now, yes, we're trying to separate and we're trying to do things in our lives that we don't agree with. We, if you don't think we got troubles, they can't even, have, they can't even elect the Speaker of the House. You're talking about troubles in our world and things going on. But that's where we are today. And what, when Moses asked to see God's glory, you heard what Mark read, the Lord said these things to him. God said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. In other words, hey, you're not gonna see my face, but you're gonna see where I've been. In other words, and that's what happened. Moses got to see God go by through the crack in the rock. And that was it. So in spite of their faithfulness, in spite of their sins, these Israelites that Moses was leading out, God showed them mercy. He showed them compassion. He gave them food. He gave them light. He took care of them. He gave them water. I know Moses got carried away in his anger, hit the rock twice, and he shouldn't have done that, but that's another story, another sermon at another time. But God shows his mercy to us. And that's why more than 1,400 years ago, after God had led the Israelites into the promised land. You see, God's glory would be revealed again in the midst of all of that. And the apostle John wrote about it, came with Jesus' coming. You heard what John wrote there. And he wrote and he says, and the word became flesh and the flesh dealt among us and we have seen his glory. Listen to that, we've seen his glory. And his glory on the one and only son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John was writing that to us. You see, what we must understand, I know we all love God and we worship God and we come here on Sunday mornings and we want to do it, but God never gives up on his people. Now, many times I thought that God has forgotten me, have you? But I realized that God said, Bob, you're going to have to walk this walk. Yo, if you read my blurb this morning it was talking about if you go through the rivers you're going to be you're not going to drown if you go through fire you're not going to be burned up and that's because God is walking with us as I wrote about Daniel's three friends that right in Shack and Abednego this morning thinking about those times in our lives last week we looked at Exodus 32 all right and you remember what happened? The people put their trust in Moses. They didn't put their trust in God. And so Moses disappeared. So what did they do? They built a golden cave so that they'd have something to worship in all that time. So we saw that. And the result is what turned about was separation from God and widespread death and suffering among all of them. 
then you heard read today from Exodus 33. Most of you don't even probably look at that part of the Bible and you probably don't even read Exodus and I'm sure you don't read Leviticus because it gets rather deep. But when we think of it, that Moses is still going to fulfill his promise to the children of Israel. God is going to do that. Moses knew he would do that. Not because they deserve it. He's going to fulfill his promise with us. It's not because we deserve it either. But because God always faithful to his promises. God is always faithful for that. And that's what Moses is telling us as we heard this scripture this morning. They entered Canaan. They entered the promised land and the land floor with milk and honey. And guess what God did? God sent an angel of the Lord ahead of them to drive out all of those people that would be fighting them and move them out of the way and said, here it is. And God let his angel escort them into the promised land. You see, the only catch in that is God will not be going with them. And that bothered Moses. And it sort of bothers you and me at times. It's, it, it, are you going with me, God? Will God go with us? That's what I'm asking all of us today in our lives. And I ask it again. It isn't enough to have, is it enough for you and me to have the promised land, but without the presence of God? Is it enough? In verse 12, as you heard Mark read, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. The Lord says, I'll go with you. And he also says something in there that I thought was interesting in that. He says, then I will give you rest. We'll talk about that. But did you hear, and you heard it read this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, did you hear that deepest yearning of Moses' heart? And it's his opinion that it's a yearning in our heart as well at times when we're wondering if God is really with us in the midst of our life. And he's asking that question, you know, in his opinion, there is Moses' opinion, there is no blessing that compares to knowing God and God's ways in our life. There's nothing that compares to that. And we believe that too. I was reading something about a, it amazed me, there was a clinical psychiatrist, or psychologist, excuse me, Larry Crabb, who wrote a book called Scattered Dreams, or excuse me, Shattered Dreams. And he wrote on it, the highest dream, listen to what Dr. Crabb said, the highest dream we could ever dream. But listen, this is a psychologist talking. Not a preacher. The highest dream we could ever have dreamed. The wish that if granted would make us happier than any other blessing. And listen to what he says. Is to know God. To actually experience him. And the problem is that you and I don't believe this idea to be true in today's lives. We don't think about that. He wrote and he says we ascend to it in our heads but we don't feel it in our hearts this is a psychologist talking to us of all the people he sees and what caused him to write a book called shattered dreams you see Moses believed this because he'd experienced God's will he would experienced God's glory he knew what it was like he'd been in God's presence and you remember, he came back from being in God's presence. He had to put a cover over his face because his face, as the Bible tells us, was glowing red, like mine gets at times. But that's not because I saw God. You think about it. Even though he had witnessed God perform awesome miracles on behalf of his people in that trip through the wilderness, if Moses had to choose between God's awesome miracles are God's absolute continuing presence. This was not a contest. For Moses wanted, as he wants us to do, know God. It's important for us to know Him. Yes, we come to worship and we read the Bible and we quote the scenes and we sing the, the hymns, which are sermons in themselves. But do we really know God? You see, the Lord's reply to him, as you heard Mark read, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now there's an argument about that, that last 
paraphrase and I will give you rest because they said it's not in the Hebrew. But I am not going to get into that. I want to know that God is with me and going to be with us and he will give us rest. And that sounds like it all the time. But I'm also amazed at what we run into in those different passages, how people argue about the interpretation and God didn't say that or God did. Some people get upset because we have Bibles with red letters in them and they want to say that Jesus didn't say that. Well, I don't know that. Sounds all right to me. I'm not getting into that issue. That's going down the road. But would you blame Moses if he chose to quit that day? Can you imagine what he'd gone through? 40 years in the wilderness with people griping and complaining <laughs> and staying there? Would we have blamed God if he'd given up on us in our lives? He didn't give up on Moses, but Moses was concerned. It must have been tempting, though, to you be both Moses and God to throw up their hands and walk away. As I read the story, I tell you what, God has a tremendous amount of patience as you hear Moses telling the story about what all transpired. And I think, well, thanks be to God. You see, they endured the complaining and they endured the idolatry and they endured the recklessness that they were going, the people were going through long enough. And I went to wondering about it. I get just as stiff necked at times with God as those Israelites did there in the wilderness. Don't we all get that way? It's okay, Moses, he said. You don't have to leave these stiff necked people anymore. I will draw my presence from them, but anything will work out fine for you. Everything will. You see, that's the old story. God was saying, but well, well, guess what Moses did when God said that? Moses said, God, these are your people. You chose them. You're gonna forget them. You're gonna walk away from them. And if you read the scripture, God relented. And I say, thank you, Moses, for standing up. He didn't let him stand up for the Israelites. He stood up for us today in 2023. It is. And when you think about it, I was amazed at what inspired in this as I read it. We all want to know that the Lord is with us. Everything. Wherever we are. I remember being in ICU and I was praying that I, I knew from what was going on that God was with me. I mean, I was never fearful that I wasn't going to come out of that. God is with me. God is with all of us. And that's why we come to church. And that's why we pray. And that's why we read the Bible. We know that there is more to this world than what we experience through our own five senses. There's more than here. We want to know that there is a way truth and a life. We want to know that and knowing God. And it's beyond our daily grind in our lives. We believe that we find ourselves and the meaning of our lives in knowing God. That's why you're here this morning. That's why you will pray. That's why you read the Bible. That's why you want to issue other, get other people to come and be a part because we want to know and believe that our lives have meaning and that God is with us. And I love it. I said to me a while ago about St. Augustine, or uh, St. Augustine is what they told me in, in seminary. I always said Augustine, but my professor says, no, it's different. St. Augustine wrote these words 1,600 years ago. They're still prevalent today. He said, Talking about God, you have made us for yourself. And God has. The scriptures tell us that. But here was Augustine saying it. And he says, O oh Lord, and you have made us for yourself, O oh Lord, and our hearts are restless. Listen to what he said. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And the U is with a capital Y. In the U. So. Why is it so easy for us to take God's presence in our lives sort of for granted? We do, don't we? If we really believe that the Almighty God, the I Am, the creator of the universe, 
is always with us. Listening to our prayers. Every time I think about listening to prayers, I have visions of Bruce Almighty. Remember that movie when he wanted to play God and had to answer all the prayers? Can you imagine what God is capable of doing? Hearing all of our prayers. And we do that. His presence is here with us. And listening to our prayers. And closer than our own breath that we have. He's closer to us than our breath. And wouldn't it be, we'd be overwhelmed with wonder and also gratitude and joy. And yet, that's not how we live, is it? Look around us. We don't really live that way. Let me ask you a question again. And consider an alternative scenario to what Moses is writing to us here in Exodus 33. What if you and I could have all the good things in our lives, the things that we in our Christian circles refer to as blessings, what if we had all of that but didn't have God? I ask you that question a second time because it's important for us to know. Would it be enough to make us happy? Really make us wealthy and secure an easy life but we wouldn't have the presence of God or any relationship with God can you imagine that what if God just left us alone that's the issue that Moses was facing in the Bible passage you heard read this one and it's the issue that you and I contend with in our lives every day as followers of Jesus Christ. That's there with us. Which do we want more? The blessings of God or God's own self in our life? What did Moses ask you? Lord, are you going to go with us? Is yourself going to be there? It's the same as questions for us. I don't know how many of you remember Dwight L. Moody, quite an evangelist, had a vibrant church in Chicago back in the mid-1800s. Took a trip to England. While he was in England, he met a young pastor by the name of Henry Moorhouse. And while he was there, Henry asked him, he said, if I come to Chicago, would you let me preach at your church? And he said, oh yeah, come and let me know and go do it. Well, he got back to the States and he forgot about that invitation. And as he got ready to go, and just, all of a sudden he got a telegram. And the guy says, I'm here, I'm on my way to Chicago. Can I preach that Sunday in Chicago? And you notice how I said that, didn't you? I said Chicago, like we Southerners say it. We put an R in it. But he was there in Chicago. And he was there. And so he was going to be gone, so he let Morehouse preach his place that Sunday morning and a week later he returned to the church to discover this this happens to pastors right he discovered that the church board had invited Morehouse to preach every night that week and his text was a very single text that he preached on every night And it was like this. One is on the mid, on the on the marquee out there. It's only John 3:16 out there, but the words are this. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Morehouse pre preached on that every night, that same passage over and over again. Every night. He preached the message that God loves sinners. Well, Dwight L. Moody got back home and he felt scandalized in all of this. And he got all upset and his wife said, Dwight L., before you make any comments, shut your mouth up and go hear him preach. And then you will have whatever you want to say. And Dr. Moody said he listened to Morehouse preach 
on the love of God. He came to know God. He said, now here's an evangelist with a large church. Here's what he said. He said that I literally, in listening to him, came to know God in a whole new way. And he went on to say, it changed my life. Here was a man with a humongous mega church that all of a sudden found something he was missing. He would later write about it in his memoirs. He wrote, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. And he said this, this part of mine, he said, began to thaw out. And I could no longer keep back the tears that I had flowing. And it was like news from a far country. And Moody said, I just drank it in. He would tell his friends later, I have never forgotten those nights that I listened to Morehouse preach. I have preached a different gospel since, totally different than what I was preaching. And I have had more power with God and man since that day. And that's what happens to us. God is with us. Our circumstances, good or bad, aren't measured by God's blessings. They're not a measure of them. Our health, our wealth, our happiness, our security, our success, they aren't measured, aren't a measure of God's blessings to us. Knowing God and living in God's presence, now those are the great blessings in life for us. It is in God that you and I can find the way, the truth, and the life. It is in God that you and I find ourselves and our purpose in life. Have we made, we ask him, have you made us for yourself? <coughs> oh Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That's what it's all about. And he is with us through it all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn sending us forth is number 672 in the red hymnal. God be with you till we meet again. We are going to sing verses 1 and 3. Let us rise and sing.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto him. Until we meet in that day when there is no sunset and no dawning. And we can literally be at his feet. And all will say amen. Thank you, Lord. It is our. Bless all of those around you and offer them God's peace and say I love you. And there's not a thing you can do about it. Offer God's love to all around you. Thank you.